Welcome to Sheboygan County Government Working For You. My name is Adam Payne. I'm the Sheboygan County Administrative Coordinator and co-host of this program with Bill Gehring, County Board Chairman. And today our guest is District Attorney Joe DiCecco. Joe is here today to talk a little bit about the roles and responsibility of the, the DA's office. So we're pleased to have you with us today, Well, Joe. thank you for having me, Joe. Why don't you start with uh, giving our viewers a little bit information about your background and your experience working in the DA's office? Well, I think as anyone who has ever talked to me knows, I'm not from Wisconsin. I'm from New England. I have a difficult time pronouncing R's, but aside from that, <laughs> uh, I came to uh, Wisconsin to go to law school in uh, 1986, graduated in 1989, and then because I learned that you don't have to take a bar exam if you stay in Wisconsin, I looked for a job in Wisconsin. And I was hired by the Sheboygan County DA's office, specifically Jim Frisch, in, um, in 1989, the year I graduated, and I've been there ever since. And you've been working in the district attorney's office here in Sheboygan County since? Since uh, September 6th of 1989. And how does one become a district attorney? A district attorney is an elected position and you have to run for office. The qualifications are relatively simple. You have to be an attorney. You have to be a member of the Wisconsin State Bar. And you have to convince enough people to vote you in. And it's a two-year term, although that's been changed now. It's going to be a four-year term, but not for a couple of uh, elections to come. So you, you have a two-year term. I have a two-year term. I have to run again in this November. And if I read the statute right, I'm going to have to run again two years in, in the next November. Then that would be a four-year term if I'm elected. And you were elected when again for our viewers? I was elected in November of 2002 and I took office in January of 2003. Oh, so it's been about a year I've been district attorney. And how's it been going? What's your first year been like as what the district attorney? a bunch of headaches, I'm telling you. I mean, <laughs> the, very first, the very first year we had, as you well know, the big budget crisis. And we were faced with uh, trying to hit our tax levy for our office. Um, and. Part of, part of that was is that uh, originally it was thought that we'd lose our, uh, uh, our check investigation unit, but we eventually worked out a solution that uh, appears to have satisfied everyone. And I, I can't go through that again, though. I, I, you know, I don't know what next, the next fiscal year will bring, but um, I'm really looking forward to kind of having an easier budget time next year and to do the types of things that we're really there to do for and that's to prosecute cases. Well, I hope you're right on the easier budget, <laughs> but I, I don't know if that's going to come I to fruition. I suspect that's correct, yeah. Why don't you share with folks how many employees you have in the department and what, what your primary responsibilities or service, services are? We have eight attorneys, seven are, including myself, seven of whom are full-time, one being a half-time attorney or employee, and we're all state employees. The state pays us directly. We also have a, uh, a uh, county employees who uh, man our office. Uh, we have two half-time employees who work in the check fraud unit. We have four county employees who work in the victim witness office. And then we have seven county employees who work as our legal support staff for transcribing uh, charges and things of that nature. So your position in the assistant district attorneys are state funded positions? They're all state funded. Um, I'm not sure the year that changed, but shortly after I became, when I first became an assistant district attorney in 1989, I was a county employee. Okay. The state then decided to assume the responsibility for the salaries of all the prosecutors throughout the states, okay. probably to attract uh, uh, qualified people to become uh, prosecutors. Uh, it, the, the salaries varied uh, so much between counties uh, that you really didn't get any continuity. You got someone who went there for a year and then went somewhere else. When the state came in, they took over the salaries of the uh, state prosecutors, and it's consistent throughout the state. So uh, I was lucky that I, I, mine was an entry-level position. I came right out of law school. I don't know of any prosecutor's office in the state that now considers anyone directly out of law school. They want someone with some experience in criminal prosecution. So I, I was kind of lucky there. But it shows that the state uh, did step in in this instance and elevated the um, professionalism of that position. Uh, so that you have people who are making a career out of being prosecutors instead of using it as a, like a, a little way station on the way to something else. Mm -hmm. So when people hear you on the radio or you're quoted in the paper, though you're the, the, the chief in that office, right. you have how many prosecutors? We have eight, and seven aside from myself. Seven aside from yourself. And, and a number of support staff that are county funded. Right. And the office itself, the, the office itself runs on a county budget. Okay. All the state pays for is our salaries. And we have to deal with all the concerns the county has in, in budgetary uh, areas, 
uh, because we're part of the county budget. Now, what is your office's relationship with the state attorney general's office? Well, it's kind of a strange relationship. Um, we are not directly um, responsible to the state attorney's office, except in some areas. We, uh, for any question of a constitutional matter, right to remain silent, right to a jury trial, all these things, if there's a disagreement and there's going to be an appeal on it, the state attorney general's office does that appeal. And the reason they do that is to make sure there's a consist consistent approach to these type of issues throughout the state. Um, if we uh, sometimes, and we have to actually apply for permission to them to appeal. If they say no, we can't do it. Sometimes they let us do it, which is fine with us. Sometimes they simply say no, you can't do it. They also provide uh, some support in the form of a criminal investigation, although you know, we're so far away from Madison, it, we really don't, uh, we don't see it as a viable option for, for our use. We, have, we use local sources. And uh, they also give opinions on how a law is to be interpreted. So, if, if a, for example, um, when the um, case came down from the Supreme Court about the shopkeeper in Milwaukee who was convicted of carry concealed weapon in his place of business, mm -hmm. and the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, no, uh, that's a legitimate uh, function and exception, law enforcement immediately called us and said, how do we enforce this? How, what, are we, what are we to do with this? And our office issued our own opinion, which was only binding and only legal until such time as the Attorney General's office did their opinion on, on how this was to be prosecuted. As it was, they never did an opinion on it, so our, in Sheboygan County, our interpretation of that law is still the one that police officers use. So that's one example of how the Attorney General's office interacts with our office. So not under their direct supervision, but there are certain things we can't do without their permission and consent. Now your office plays a vital role in the community and I want to make sure we touch on this. Some of the responsibilities of your office, give us a flavor for the types of things your sure. office does. Our primary responsibility is to prosecute all criminal acts that occur in, in Sheboygan County. Those include traffic crimes, those include misdemeanors which are uh, serious crimes but not serious enough to go to prison, and they include felonies which are the, more, the most serious crimes in which prison could be an option. In addition, we also uh, prosecute non-traffic offenses uh, such as speeding tickets and a whole host of other types of moving violations for both the Sheboygan County Sheriff's Department and the Wisconsin State Patrol. Uh, we also do any forfeitures uh, of a forfeiture ordinance that is issued by the Sheboygan County Sheriff's Department or the State Patrol. We also prosecute those. We're also responsible for prosecuting all juvenile matters in the, in the county of Sheboygan. So uh, child in need of protection of services, which is called CHIPS, juvenile in need of protection of services, which is called a GIPS, a delinquent child, which is simply a child that's underage that's committed a crime, and a termination of parental rights. Those are all our office's responsibilities. And then to add to that, uh, some unfunded mandates from the state have, uh, have required that we do, um, for example, we do wage claims, which is when a person uh, believes that they've been underpaid or not paid, paid the proper amount. Uh, we get those cases uh, coming from the Department of Labor. And we also do, um, I guess that wage claims is really the main thing, that is the extra thing of which uh, there's no funding for whatever, we just have to do it. So a real breadth of programs. It's a breadth of programs and at times it kind of distracts us, not distracts us, but it'd be a lot better if all we did was criminal matters which is our primary function, but we can't because we are required by law to do a number of other uh, functions as well. So you've shared, you know, again, the makeup of your department, the association with the Attorney General's office, you're, you're housed in the courthouse, you right. have state-funded employees, uh, employees funded through the property tax through Sheboygan County. Before I turn it over to the chairman, uh, Bill Gehring, what's your relationship with the county board? How does that then interact with your functions? Well, because um, even though I'm a state employee and all the attorneys are state employees, we still have everyone else in the office is a county employee, plus our office operating budget is a, comes out of the county budget. So we're responsible to our uh, liaison committee, which is a law committee, to report to them on a regular basis uh, for any uh, variation in our, in our expenditures and things of that nature. Uh, ultimately, we're responsible to the county board. A perfect example of that is in trying to keep the uh, check fraud unit a viable option. And, uh, we instituted the check uh, diversion program with the help of uh, Corporation Counsel Carl Beesing. Um, and that was, we had to go through the law committee. Uh, we had to go through um, 
I'm, I'm sure the other committee we had to go through, I don't know if it's human resources or finance, I think it was finance, think so and then I had to go to the county board for a general vote. So what we do in the office as far as uh, budgets and our operation is really uh, intricately tied to county government. And, and of course we interact with other agencies within the county, most notably the Sheboygan County Sheriff's Department, but certainly the Highway Department, all, all sorts of, of, of different entities, Emergency Medical Services Council, um, mostly to make sure we're all on the same page, to make sure we're not operating across pur purposes. So uh, our relationship to the county, the county board and the county government is, a, is, a, is intermeshed. It's critical that we go into that relationship with an understanding of what the responsibilities of all the people are and, and when there are differences of opinion that we work to resolve them so that we can get the result that we want. Very good. Thank you, Joe. Joe, I understand that the demands on your office and your caseload constantly has increased. Could you talk about the number of cases that you prosecuted during the year 2003? Oh, sure, Bill. Um, in fact, I, I brought a list here because I won't remember these numbers without looking at it. Um, we prosecuted a total of criminal cases in uh, 2002, and that's traffic, felony, and misdemeanor, was about uh, 3,300. Uh, in uh, 2003, that number jumped to uh, about 3,700. Our juvenile cases, and those are all delinquencies, the chips, the gyps, all this stuff, uh, jumped from 578 to 600. Uh, and um, we've really experienced, each year we experience a rise in the number of cases we do it. Now, in 2003, the number of misdemeanors went down slightly, but the number of felonies went up. Uh, so that's, you can't really, looking at a total number, the felonies are the more complicated cases that take more time. They're usually more than a one-day trial, whereas something like operating after a vacation is a morning trial. So you really can't tell by looking at the number of cases, um, but you can get a, a good idea of the, of the amount of work you're doing by uh, the numbers going up, which have gone up consistently over the last several years in Sheboygan County. Obviously, one year is just kind of a snapshot, and there could just be a spike, but is there one type of case that seems to be increasing most? Is it the felony? Is are they serious it is. Uh, the or? cases that are increasing most are felony drug dealing. Mm -hmm. um, we've experienced an influx uh, over 2003 of more drug dealers coming up from either Milwaukee or Chicago, uh, establishing uh, a base here uh, in Sheboygan and selling, most of them are selling crack cocaine, which is really uh, one of the most insidious drugs uh, and addictive drugs that there is. Um, has, has nowhere, powder cocaine has nowhere near the addictive power of crack cocaine. And we prosecute these people, we send them to prison, we're not messing around with them. Um, that's one of the uh, increases in the, the types of cases we had uh, over the last, actually over the last couple of years. We've more and more uh, crack cocaine drug dealers are coming into the county. Okay. Has your office expanded the type of cases that are prosecuted or? Actually, we have, and it's, uh, you know, post uh, September 11th, when I took office in January of this, of last year, rather, 2003, um, one of the uh, areas that I was asked to address was identity theft. Identity theft is when someone uh, takes an identifying document uh, or even the name of another person and uses it as their own. It's one of the most rapidly growing crimes across the country. And in January, I decided uh, that we should be aggressively prosecuting these kind of cases. And most of those cases come from motor vehicles, where people who may not be legal in this country, who purchase someone's social security number, try to get a Wisconsin driver's license or an ID card um, using that uh, false or stolen social security number. And that's a felony in the state, and we've had 16 or 18 cases, about 18, I guess, over the last year uh, that we never prosecuted before. Um, that we're prosecuting now. I think it's important that uh, people understand that you've got to be really careful about your identifying documents, uh, check numbers, uh, credit card numbers, um, uh, your social security number for certainly, and because some, once someone gets a hold of this, uh, they can just ruin your life. Uh, they can uh, ruin your credit, they can, uh, uh, in fact, even in these relatively uh, simple types of someone just using someone else's numbers, those people get a job and that's their social security number. So the person who it really belongs to is suddenly notified by the IRS that they have not declared twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars in income. Well they didn't earn that. It's the other person earning it, but the social security number is the same. And that causes problems because as you probably know, for federal bureaucracies to correct the problem is just just like snails. Um, and uh, I thought it was important enough to aggressively prosecute these cases, so that has added to our caseload. 
Okay. So then there actually is identity theft actually happening in Sheboygan County, not that somebody's opening the mail that you send to Chicago or New York and get your numbers, but it's happening right, right it's here It's happening in Sheboygan. In Sheboygan. We've only had two or three very severe cases. Uh, the severe cases where someone has actually taken the additional step of getting a credit card or line of credit uh, in someone else's name using someone else's social security number. And that is just a, a quagmire to try and clean up. Um, we only have two or three of those cases. Most of the cases we prosecute or someone who's in the country, I believe that they're in here illegally, they're trying to get an ID card. Uh, those people are very cooperative when they're challenged. They admit that they bought, they bought it in Milwaukee or Chicago for 200 bucks or whatever. And we have a standard uh, disposition for those people because they're not, they're not terrorists, they're not, mm -hmm. they're not the traditional identity theft uh, uh, thieves. Okay. Has your department taken on any new initiatives under your leadership? Well, we tried to do a number of things, but um, we did apply for a grant early in January, which would have had us have another attorney, which was shared with Fond du Lac County for a prosecution of domestic violence uh, uh, cases, of which, by the way, about one third of all the cases we have are domestic violence related, whether it's a misdemeanor uh, disorderly conduct or, or a misdemeanor battery. Um, and it was very um, disappointing to see that fall through. We thought we had a very good chance. It was a new program. Uh, we did everything, we were doing everything that the program wanted us to do, and unfortunately existing programs in the larger counties got the funding, uh, which wasn't really the purpose of this, of this grant, <laughs> but we don't control it, the state controls it. Since then I've been looking for grants, any source of revenue, and unfortunately all the Homeland Security and 911 funding uh, is for uh, law enforcement agencies, for uh, emergency medical service agencies, uh, for county government uh, preparedness plans, and there really isn't, uh, at least as far as I could find from searching for months now, um, funding to uh, supply prosecutors to prosecute crimes that may be committed by people who are either here illegally or are, are engaging in, in illegal, act illegal activities which may reflect on our concerns about uh, concerning uh, 911. We've talked a little bit already about the budget cut that you had to meet for the year 2004 this year. Could you tell us what you had to cut or how you did meet the budget requirements? Well, it was just, it was very difficult. Um, we looked at, we, I sat down with my uh, office manager, Carla, uh, Carla Peterman, and with Dion Kanap, who's the victim witness uh, coordinator. And because those are, while they're all part of our office, they have, we have, they don't have separate budgets, but we have to consider them separately in doing our budget because, for example, the victim witness office gets reimbursed for all their expenses by a percentage from the state, which helps us out a lot. Uh, which is going down now, but, and so we, we went down and just looked at everything, every line by line item and made cuts everywhere we could and we were still about $14,000 shy of our tax, tax, tax levy target and we just couldn't cut anymore. And that's when, uh, when we went to our liaison committee, uh, the uh, budget was approved but taking out the, the check people which would have uh, made up for that difference. Uh, I thought that was a vital service that we just couldn't uh, do without and plus the repercussions of that would be that now instead of these people doing all this work for checks, it would fall back to law enforcement because these people do the checks in the whole county, they don't just do them for the city. And so we were able to, working with the law committee, working with corporation council, working with the county board, we were able to um, present a program, uh, a diversion program where fees would be paid directly to the county uh, for uh, the uh, consideration of not being prosecuted if they, if they pay the checks. So that took some time and it was a lot of work by a lot of people, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm still convinced is that when, when reasonable people sit down, even though they have difference of opinion, that they can work something out. And that's exactly what was done here. And the credit goes to the, uh, the law committee, uh, the county board, uh, to Kyle Beezing. Uh, I'll take a little credit myself for trying to get it done. <laughs> But uh, that's, that's to me is what county government's about. It's working together to resolve a problem that, that everyone is happy with. It's fairly new in the year and new into that changed program, but do we have any projections about whether the income will in fact meet the expenses? Well, we, just, we, we began it January 2nd and um, uh, several hundred people who have worthless, we have a lot of worthless checks in this county have indicated their willingness to, to participate in the program. But we need to, you know, the, the, there's an administrative fee of $35. Um, so until we get their money, then we'll know what kind of uh, uh, revenue we're generating. Uh, it looks like uh, it's gonna work out very well, uh, particularly be 
because we get a bunch of checks at one time, then we may not have so many in the next period, then get a whole bunch of them again. And most people are responding favorably. They, they realize they'll have no criminal record, they'll have no ordinance violations, they pay an administrative fee, they pay off the checks, and we just close the case. And that saves time for us, it just saves time. The merchants get their money back, uh, or whoever uh, was the recipient of the worthless check, and we generate revenue for the county to help support our, um, our, our budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand that a recent study showed that Sheboygan County should have a number of additional DAs that we don't have. Could you expand uh, upon that? This, this is a continuing problem. Um, when prosecutors became state employees, the state began a statewide survey of figuring out a method to, to determine how, how many prosecutors would be, would be needed in any one office. And they finally, I'm not sure, exactly sure how they do it, it's not just straight numbers, it's a percentage for certain felonies and misdemeanors and things like that. But we've been consistently, uh, at least according to the state uh, survey, um, under what we're supposed to have. And that's been for several years now. And I think even the second year I became, when I w was a state prosecutor, we were, the very first survey that came out said we were three prosecutors shy of what we needed. The latest survey that came out indicated we're four and a half prosecutors mm -hmm. shy of what we need. And um, it makes it very difficult for us. Uh, we do the job, we have to put prioritized cases and some have to kind of sit in a shelf that don't need immediate attention for a little bit until we can get to them. But uh, it's, it's really a handicap. The only resolution to that, unfortunately, uh, is for more money for, for state prosecutors. And given the level of the budget crisis uh, in the state, I, I'm not optimistic that that will come about anytime soon. So in the meantime, we just, we just keep doing the job we're doing Hope we don't get too far behind and um, just keep plugging away. Okay. Thank you. And you have been plugging away. All I hear, Joe, are good things about the job you're doing, that your office is doing. And in spite of these challenges, again, a lot of positive feedback. And I know you feel positive about your staff. Why don't you talk about that just a little well, bit? Well, I, I think that the staff really, had, even though we got so much work to do, I, I always believe that uh, creating a, a healthy, uh, work environment uh, is very important uh, for the productivity of your staff, even, even if you're swamped with stuff. And one of the first things I did when I took office was to make sure that there were open lines of communications through all the staff members. If there are any problems, we need to talk about them and, and resolve them, not let them fester for a period of time. Um, and we have a generally relatively loose attitude in the staff. We have, you know, Fridays are casual Fridays for, not for lawyers, but for the other staff. I like to feel that anyone could come to me with a problem and we would sit down with whoever it is and, and work it out. It's just a much more congenial atmosphere. I'm very happy to have been uh, a part of that and uh, I'm very pleased with the result. Uh, the, everyone who works there seems to be happy. I mean, you can't be happy every day, but um, certainly there's a new attitude, uh, there's a new vitality to the office, and I'm very pleased with that outcome. Yeah, as are we. Um, one of the things that I understand is the case is that you've assigned a prosecutor to each of our five circuit court judges. That's correct. What's your relationship with the judges? How, how has that been working? Well, we kind of got this sweet and sour relationship with the judges. I mean, we have to work with them every day, obviously, and they have their own opinions about certain things, and we have our own opinions. And I, but I, I, I go back to the example of, of trying to work with county government. You know, I go to all the judges' meetings. And if they have a, a, a problem, we try and work it out. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes it's a matter of my discretion, and that's the way my policy, and uh, a compromise can't be reached because that's my job. But most of the time, the vast majority of the time, uh, we work things out. Um, you know, Chief Judge Ed Stengel, is, his office is always open to me. Uh, we kid around and court a lot when everything's done. Uh, uh, he's very pleasant. Uh, all the judges are very pleasant to work with, but certainly the Chief Judge is... Uh, uh, very easy to work with. And we may differ on what we think uh, should happen to a criminal, what their sentence should be. We may differ on the, how the case is progressing. But I think everyone realizes that we all have uh, different jobs to do. We're all part of the same system. And uh, whenever the compromise can be done uh, to alleviate a problem in the court calendar, we try and do that. And the judges accommodate us to it. If, uh, I can give you an example. For the first time uh, uh, in 2003, uh, I was, the judges agreed to allow to have one week of very limited court appearances so our attorneys could go to training. They have to be recertified. And before it was catch as catch can. We could never get this time off. 
And I approached the judge and said, we really need to do this. It'll, you know, it'll increase our, uh, decrease our downtime. Uh, if you can possibly make this week, which is the, a week-long conference, where we can get all the credits we need, I really appreciate it. And they responded and said, sure. And it worked out just fine. And we're going to do that every year. And that also cuts down on our expenses because the state pays for most of that training. Uh, when you have to kind of catch as catch can with these one-day things, sometimes the state doesn't pay, and we have to take it out of our budget. We only have a couple of minutes okay. remaining, and you've covered a lot of ground mm -hmm. in this short 30-minute program and have talked about a lot of challenges with your caseloads going up, with your staffing really not being what, where it needs to be, challenges with the budget. Uh, as you look you know, in the years ahead, what do you see as the key challenge, probably the greatest challenge or concern that you have in your, in your profession and, and where we're headed? I think, unfortunately, one of the key challenges is going to be continued budget concerns. I really think that's going to affect us for a long time. I think we can work through that, but it's going to be, it's going to be a big obstacle to work through. Uh, aside from the budget, uh, you know, things are changing all the time. Um, laws are constantly being changed and revised, and we have to, we have to um, uh, respond to that. Uh, and uh, I've got people, I've experienced prosecutors who are starting to approach retirement age. And we're going to have to think about replacing prosecutors. Um, I'm not approaching retirement age because I started so late. I'm going to be here for you know, 40 years, or you know, if I get elected again. <laughs> but, but that's some of the that's the problems. I think the budget is the main thing. But that's kind of a short-term, really focused problem, relatively short-term. The long-term is uh, keeping the staff, the prosecutors I have, and the staff I have, even the support staff is approaching retirement. They're just so good at what they do, and uh, when it comes time for them to leave, when they retire, it's going to be very difficult to replace them. I'm not surprised to hear you mention the budget because for all of us in government mm -hmm. at any level, it's uh, really driving the services we provide and what level mm -hmm. we provide and there are a lot of needs. Joe, I want to thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. I know how well, busy you are and again, uh, we appreciate the fine job you and your staff are doing. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Next month, we're going to have Roger Landing, the Highway Commissioner, join us to talk a little bit about some of the challenges he and his staff have keeping the roads clear and safe during the winter months and offering some tips to you on how you can help them do our job. So until then, on behalf of County Board Chairman Bill Gehring and myself, Adam Payne, thank you for joining us.